All right, it's Christmas season. Wow. I'm so excited about the Christmas season. I, I don't know if you guys are. Uh, it's December, so we know that that means it's Christmas season. And, and Christmas season is so amazing. It's fun, right? Uh, you got the presents. You got the crazy shopping. Um, you, <clears throat> you have a lot of, uh, you know, Christmas curling. You know, I don't know if fa la 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 you, you have all those experiences, but I'm going to say something about an experience that we have sometime around Christmas season, is we have family members come around. I, I got a question. Do you have any family members that you kind of like maybe want to avoid this year? No, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Some of us, we don't want to be real. Everybody has some messy members, some messy family members. So just be real. That's, that's just reality. You, you, don't, you don't have some, some people that you just, like, you know, it's like, gosh, man, I know when I deal with this person, it's going to be like, e. Some of us, we can't say it because we act like super religious. Like, I guess because we're in the church, we act like, you know, everything's perfect in families. Let me tell you, no family's perfect. Let's get that straight right now. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at something today because we're starting a series called Christ Mess. Finding Christ in your mess. Because sometimes in life there's a mess and we have to be able to find Christ in the midst of it. We have to be able to identify Christ. We have to be able to see Jesus. We got to see good in our mess. And so today we'll be talking about messy members. We're going to look at someone that you probably would think had a perfect, he had a perfect family, Jesus. Have you ever seen in the Bible when, in the Bible it will say, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, or Joseph had a son named and it just goes on and on and on for a whole bunch of verses, right? Where it says, John had Jesse, Jesse had Kessie, Kessie had Mary, Mary had... I mean, have you ever read that in the Bible where it's just a lot of... I mean, just for, for a lot of verses, just over and over again, it just says... Most of the time, we just jump over that part, right? We're like, ah, let me just skip past that. And Matthew actually puts a big light on that. Matthew chapter 1, all the way through uh, verses 1 through 16, it, it just says a lot of names, and it's talking about Jesus' family. But as you look at it, Jesus had a messy family. You know, for us that all got the perfect family, Jesus didn't have it. Jesus didn't have a perfect family. Jesus had a messy family. I mean, typically... We just blow through those verses, but I want, I want to go and extract a few of these verses and look at it, the genealogy. Because genealogy was very important for the Jews. For without them, they could not prove their tribal membership or their rights at certain inheritances. They couldn't actually inherit certain things because they had to prove that they were a Jew. They had to prove that they were in a certain lineage. And Jesus did the same thing because in Matthew, Matthew is proving that Jesus is the king of Jews. Matthew is proving that. That's, that's what is proven uh, all throughout Matthew. And so right here in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it says, this is the family history of Jesus Christ. He came from the family of David, and David came from the family of Abraham, and Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Now, Jacob, if we want to grab Jacob for right, Jacob was actually what you would call a schemer, okay? You know, manipulator. What he done to get his inheritance was very schematic. He, he burned his brother Esau. You know, he, he manipulated him so he could actually get the birthright. And so he was a deceiver, and he deceived his way into prosperity. God allowed it, of course, but it took place. Now, this guy is in the lineage 
of Jesus. He, when they start talking about Jesus and where he came from, now Jacob's name pop up, the deceiver, the, the manipulator. Then it continues in verse 3. It said, Judah was the father of Pettis and Zerah. Their mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram. Now look, Tamar, <laughs> she was really manipulative because Tamar was, Tamar's dad, father-in-law, was Judah, right? And so it was very, very dangerous because he, she, her son, her husband died, and when her husband died, she didn't have someone to uh, have a child with. So typically at that time, they would have the, the brother, the next oldest brother would take the wife so they could continue the, the bloodline through a son. Well, the son didn't want to have any relationship with Tamar. He did, but he kind of like did something that he had no business doing. And then he ended up passing away. So she manipulated her father-in-law to have sex with her. No, this is crazy. This, this stuff is good. If you, ever, if you ever read the Bible, the Bible is like, I mean, I don't know why we'd be looking at all these stuff like on Netflix. If you just read the Bible, you, you'll be amazed. I'm serious. There's some crazy stuff going on. I was like, are you serious? So she manipulated. She hid herself and looked as if she was a, a, a prostitute on the side of the road, and he picked her up and had sex with her, and then she revealed to him later like it was me. And he's like, are you serious? And, and so... She's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Tamar, with a woman who deceived her father-in-law. So verse 4 goes on and said, Ram was the father of Amadab. Amadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz. Boaz's mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, and Obed's mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Now, Rahab was a prostitute. She hid the people that were, Joshua sent some spies into uh, a city so they could actually go in and conquer that city because at that time Jesus uh, hadn't came yet, but God had actually gave the land to uh, Joshua after Moses died. And so they went to a place and, and uh, Rahab's this prostitute and she's the only one that would hide God's people, the Israelites, so they wouldn't get killed. And so she led them into her house, this prostitute, and now here she is. She's in the family tree of Jesus. Then you got this name, Ruth. Now, Ruth was a Moab. Now, a, a Moabite, excuse me. And so a Moabite, right? She was a Moab. And Moabites worshipped other gods. Like, they were, they worshipped all these different gods. They worshipped anything. They didn't worship God, you know, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They worshipped anything besides God. And so she worshipped false idols, and she was a non-Jew. Now, here she is. She's in the family tree of Jesus, this, this false idol worshiper. And, oh, yeah, did, did I tell you that actually at this time in history, women did not get named in the lineage at all. The reason why women didn't get named is because, you know, of course, if you can remember back, uh, you know, don't reveal it if you can, because that reveals your age. But there was a season where, like they would say, businessman instead of business person or business woman, because women didn't have rights to even vote. And that was just in the 50s. Right. So just think back to 2000 years ago, women were not even in the family tree, they didn't even get named. Matter of fact, they would have to like look down and cover their head and things like that. Not that it was right, but that was what season they were in. But here it is. These individuals were in the lineage of Jesus. This is a messy family tree. But as we observe Jesus' family, maybe we can feel pretty good this year about maybe our family, right? One of the things is he had all kind of mixed races. Right. So, if you, you know, if you got any uh, mixed races in your family, that, that, there's nothing wrong with that. He had mixed races. He had Jews. He had non-Jews. He had Moabites. He had people that were believers. He had people that weren't believers. He had people that, you know, at this time, it was unheard of to be in the family tree. It was a messy situation. It was a mess. But yet at the end of this, we find Christ in it. 
Let me give you this. Uh, Jesus' family members involved all races and nationalities. Right to this day, that's why the church is supposed to be full of different nationalities. As a matter of fact, the church should always be full of people that are saved and unsaved as well. It's not about just people being saved. It's about people who may not know Christ and people that may not know God, people that may not have had an experience with God, and they actually get a chance to come into God's family. This is the messy situation that Jesus had going on. And so Jesus was, had a family that was very messed up. They had some messy members. In verse 6, it continues in the lineage. It says, Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon. Solomon's mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, David, we know he committed adultery, right, with Solomon's mom, which was Bathsheba. And then, of course, he hid, uh, you know, hid that, and then he ended up murdering the husband in order to hide his Shame. And Solomon was the father of uh, Rehoboam, and Rehoboam was the father of Abijah, and Abijah was the father of Asa. And so Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So if you add that up, he could see one, right? You know, he could see one every three years. Or if, if he probably doing it the way I thought, he probably had like 10 or 15 all at one, just like fanning him at the same time, right? I don't know. This guy had a thousand women. That was his. Now, and, and he's in the lineage of Jesus. Now, of course, this is a lot of information, but the, the information is clear because sometimes we have messy members. We have messy family. And around Christmas time, I don't care what nobody says. Some of us act like we're going to have a great time and we will. But some, many times, you know that it amplifies the issues that goes on in family. If it's some problems in family, oh, yeah, Christmas will bring it out all of a sudden. You know, Christmas will have everybody sitting around a dinner table shooting jabs at each other. Yes or no? Don't act like I'm the only one to have family like that. And so you'll have a family, and a lot of times, you know, it's messy. And it's nothing wrong with that because Jesus even had a messy family membership. Look, look what it says. It says, about Solomon. Solomon had 700 wives, 300 concubines, which was mistresses, and his wives all worshiped other gods. And God had warned him about that, and he just totally disregarded it. And he said, okay, I'm going to get whatever woman I want. And, and they all turned his heart from God because of the simple fact they all had different gods. Now, also in verse 10, it says, Matthew 1.10, it says, Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh. Manasseh was the father of Ammon, and Ammon was the father of Josiah. Now, Manasseh was a very wicked king. He was super wicked. I mean, he was so wicked. He got the throne when he was 12, and he reigned for 55 years. So he died at 67, and, and from, at 67 years old, he, he had done so much chaos in the kingdom of God. I mean, he took Israelites and he just it flipped them all the way upside down. I mean, he was doing so much wicked things. I mean, he killed people who were innocent. He just took people's land when he wanted to. And here it is. He's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, I need y'all to get that because some of us, I think we come to church and when we come to church, we miss it. We think that coming to church, think that we're right, make us right, but we come to church in order to get right. We, we don't come to church because we got it together. You know, don't ever, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't like when people get to start coming to church and they start looking down on people that don't come to church or they don't come to church often or, or they don't know all the scriptures or, or they don't know, you know, the right verbiage or, oh, they don't know how to dress. You can dress however you want to dress. I mean, it's, 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 you know, you can come how you want to come because God accepts you the way you are. Here it is. This tells us that all this does is points towards God's grace. All of this that I just now discussed points towards God's grace and how God is merciful and he's loving and he's kind towards all of us. And so another thing we got to get is Jesus accomplishes his purpose in spite of difficult circumstances and even the character of people involved. Like a lot of times you think that you may mess up your whole situation. 
Sometimes we feel like we destroy the plan of God. Anybody ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like, man, I messed it all the way up? Like, I blew it. Like, I don't know if you're like me. I feel like I blow it all the time. I feel like I blow it. You know, I know some of y'all, y'all got it all together. But for me, and I feel like I blow it all the time. Like, I miss it. Like, man. But God right here shows us, in spite of all this difficulty, in spite of all these character flaws and these de- defects, in spite of a wicked king, in spite of a daughter-in-law that had sex with her own dad, you know, in spite of a prostitute, in spite of a guy that had this lust problem, had 700 wives, in spite of a, a, a king named David that killed a guy just so he could have his wife, in spite of all all this drama, this deceiver called Jacob, who manipulated his way into the inheritance, in spite of all this, God says, you are not that powerful to stop my hand from moving. You're not that powerful to stop the plan of God. That's so beautiful because it points towards God's grace because so many times we mess up. So many times we have messy situations, messy members. Jesus had messy members. If God can use the people in Genesis uh, all the way to Matthew with all their hangups, all their habits and all their flaws, then I'm here to tell you that God can use you. In spite of all your mess ups. Matter of fact, let's move on. In verse 11, it says Josiah was the grandfather of uh, Joachim. And his brother, this was at the time that people were taken by Babylon, meaning they were in captivity. After they were taken to Babylon, Jehoiakim was the father of Sheotil. Sheotil was the grandfather of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abud. Abud was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azar. Azar was the father of Zadak. Zadak was the father of Achan. Achan was the father of Eliod. Eliod was the father of Eleazar. Eleazar was the father of Mathen. Mathen was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph. And Joseph was the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus. Jesus is called our Savior, Christ. Here it is. Christ is found in the midst of this mess. Christ is right in the midst of all the mess that's going on. Christ is in the midst of the, right in the midst. Not that he agrees with it, not that he condones it, not that he's saying, I I think that you should do this, but God's saying, in the midst of your mess, you can still find me. In the midst of your messy family, you can still find me. In the midst of your messy members, right in these messy members, there was a lot of mess going on. And Jesus is right in the midst of it. If God can use these people that were a mess, can we all agree that they were a mess? Every last one of them were a mess. And if you think about it, have you ever reflected on your issue? Are you a mess? Do you have messy situations going on? Do you have a messy family? Do you have some messy situations that you may not be all that proud to speak upon? But the fact of the matter is, Jesus can actually accomplish his purpose. Jesus can still accomplish his purpose, whatever it may be. I don't know what God has spoke to you about. I don't know what God said he want you to do in life. I don't know what he has planned for you. That's not my thing. God reveals his plans to people. God reveals his will. I don't reveal your God's will to you personally. I speak the word of God and hopefully God is doing something in your heart. And I pray that God is doing something in your heart. And I know that God is doing something in your heart. And he tells you, I want you to do such and such. And even though you're in a mess, sometimes you begin to start doubting that you can actually accomplish it. Anybody ever done that? You begin to start thinking, God, there's no way you can use me. I am a mess. I begin to start telling God all of my history as if he didn't know. When he began to start telling me he wanted to do something in my life. When he told me he wanted to preach, I started telling him how, you know, how much education I had. And God was like, okay. I began to start telling him that, you know, my background, all the things I've done to people. He said, okay. I began to start telling him about my family and, you know, how how long of, of, you know, of history we have of criminal activity. He's like, okay. And when he concluded, he was saying, what 
does that have to do with my power and my ability to use you? What that got to do with my ability and my power? Don't ever doubt God's power and his ability. Right here, he brought out a savior and out of the midst of a deceiver, in the midst of prostitutes, in the midst of idol worshipers, in the midst of people that committed adultery, in the midst of people that were messy, messy members. He had some messy members that he came out of. And watch this. I want to tell you this before we close up. As the savior of all mankind, he can relate to all people in every situation. Why would he allow that to go on in his family? You know he could have stopped it, right? You know God is powerful, all powerful. He can do anything. He allowed every situation, every scenario, every circumstance to take place. He allowed everything to take place. And guess what? He can relate to everybody. There is not one family that's too messy that he can't relate to. You say, well, well, you know what, man? My daughter, she goes out there and she gets on Facebook and she hooks up with people and, and she has relations for, for money. And he's like, oh, yeah, I had a great, 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 great auntie named Rahab, man. She, she used to do the same thing. We don't understand, man. My son never tells the truth. He's always manipulating. He's always scheming. He's always saying he's going to do one thing and he ends up doing another. And Jesus says, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I had a partner named Jacob. Great, 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 great grandfather of mine. That's all he done was schemed. Well, you don't understand. They don't even believe in God. Well, it was this lady named Ruth. That was my great, 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 great grandmother. And she was a Moabite, and she didn't believe in God either. Matter of fact, she believed in other gods. And you will begin to start putting all your excuses, all your complaints, everything that you think may disqualify you from being able to serve and love God and accept God, you'll be able to put all those down when understanding that Jesus, our Savior, of mankind, Jesus Christ came up in a messy family and he can relate to all people in every situation. There is nothing you can do or present to him that he won't be able to understand. There's nothing that you can present because sometimes we feel as if we have a God that can't relate with us. Sometimes we feel like that. Any person that has a background can find comfort Understanding, direction, compassion, love. It was a mess. Christ's family tree was a mess. As we look at this Christmas season, and we're counting down, of course. If you begin to start thinking like, man, my family is a mess. Just look back and say, you know what? My Savior, he had a messy family as well. Messy members. If we can believe the Bible, if we can grab the Bible, if we really believe what God's words say, we can look in Matthew chapter 1 verse 1 through 16 and we can get some type of consolation. We can get some comfort that, man, God, you actually comfort me with this, that I'm not the only one. Because some of us, oh, we all have this thing like, well, no, everybody's family is not as crazy as mine. Well, you don't know that. Because everybody thinks their family is the craziest. I remember when I was growing up, I swore up now, there is no family crazier than mine. There is no way. It's impossible. Are you serious? We'll turn a good thing into a mess. It's supposed to be great. And we would just turn it upside down. And I, I just thought that my family was the craziest. There's no way anybody can relate to it. There's no way that anyone can understand. And you may feel that way too. Well, you don't know my Uncle Pete. You don't know my cousin Reuben. He's a trip. Jesus said, did you meet David? Have you read about Solomon and had all these women? Well, every time my uncle comes, I don't know who's my auntie again because, hey, he has a different woman every time. I don't know if I should call her auntie or what do I call her? I said, well, do you remember David, son, Solomon? Thousand wives and concubines added together. 
Some of us, I think that we do that and we got to understand in the midst of a mess, we find a savior. That's where we find a savior. One of the things we got to get is that Jesus, his family, and that's you and I, we're all part of God's family when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. It was all types of different nationalities and it was all different backgrounds. Everybody had a different background. Everyone. That's the beauty of, of Jesus' family. And then two, you know what? It didn't matter what flaw. It didn't matter what difficulties or, or character hangups that they had. Jesus was going to accomplish his purpose anyway. God's plan prevails no matter what. No matter how much you missed it. No matter how much you blew it. Jesus says, my plan prevails forever. My word goes out and it accomplishes exactly what I set it out to accomplish. You try to mess it up all you want. My word is more powerful than you, God says. God says, I send my word out. I send my plan out. I send my purpose out and it prevails. I speak and it changes things. God's word does just that. Many of us, we got to start recognizing what the church is. The church is a hospital. It's full of sick, broken, bruised, beaten, and battered people. That's just the church. Because of sin and unrighteousness, that's, that's the church. We come in beaten, busted, but we come for help. A hospital, you come for the antidote. You come for your sicknesses to be healed. Who hangs out at a hospital and they're sick and they say, hey man, I need a room in there. They say, okay, cool. You know, well, I just want to hang out here. I don't, I don't want to get better. Don't give me no medicine. I don't want to see a doctor. As a matter of fact, if the doctor tells me something, I don't want no parts of the doctor's instructions. I don't know if they will use their facilities for that, huh? I think that the, you know, the hospital somewhere, and everybody would justify that the hospital would be correct, right? They'd be correct to like say, hey, you know what, it's time for you to go. You know, it don't seem like you want to do any of the instructions from the doctor. You're trying to misuse our property. That's what they would say, right? No. And so that's what the church is. The church is a place where we come in sick but we walk out healed. We come in beaten and bruised, but we go out bandaged and stitched up. We, we, we come in broken and we walk out whole. That's why when people walk through the doors of Metanoia, you should never be critical and judgmental about how they walked in, ever. Because you don't know if that would be you needing to walk through those doors in those conditions one day. There, there's no way, and you know, and I would be safe to say that everybody's going to do it. I walk through those doors busted up many times. I, I come to God, you know, busted up, you know, pretty much every day because I need a Savior. Without a messy situation, you won't seek a Savior for the occasion. Without a messy situation, if everything's okay, you don't need a savior. If everything's okay, you don't need help. If you're not sick, you don't need a hospital. If you're not beaten down, you don't need a doctor. You don't need any of that. You don't need an antidote. You don't need any medicine at all because you're fine. But that's not what the church is about, right? As we see God's family, as we see Jesus' family, it was messy. It was a mess. And they were in need of a savior. Do you know all these people that were messing up? You know where their faith was at? People, a lot of people ask me, they say, well, what about all the people in the Old Testament? How did they get saved? Because Jesus hadn't come yet. Because you and I, we can put our faith back in Jesus and what he did at the cross. We got what we call backward faith. We put our faith back in what Jesus did at the cross. But back then, they had the hope and they had the faith that one day that God was going to send a deliverer. 
That's why if you notice the woman at the well, she came and she said, are you the Messiah? The one that we looking for? Like everyone was looking for someone to deliver them. Now they thought it was going to be a different delivery. Some of them thought that they were going to pull him up out of the, the clutches of Rome and, and pull him out of the, the mess that was going on in the world. But Jesus came to save us from our sins. Jesus came to save us from our hurts. Jesus came to save us from our discomfort, from, from our pain and our sorrow. That's what Jesus came to do. So without a messy situation, you won't seek a savior for your occasion. For the occasion, what is, what is it? What is your occasion? I don't know what it is. It may be the mess that's going on in your, in your marriage. It may be a mess going on internally, just messy, just, you know, have you ever been in a situation where your, your brain is just like on overload, there's all kind of stuff just coming through your brain, like just shooting in your brain and it's just like nonstop, anybody, is that just me? Like just stuff just constantly coming in your brain, it's like you almost can't even stop it, it's just like, oh my God, it's just stuff just constantly, uh, uh, and it's just, over, it's just overwhelming, you just feel like smoke is coming out of your ears. I get that every single day. No, seriously. I was like that on the way over here. I was like, man, I start, you start pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. You begin to start praying. And you ask God, I know this is a messy situation, but I can find you, Christ Jesus, in this mess. In this messy membership, the family of Jesus Christ. It was a mess, schemers, manipulators. Christ was right in the midst of it. Christ, right now, I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know where you're at, but Christ is right in the midst of it. Christ is right here, right now, in the midst of whatever's going on in your life. Today, I ask you to bow your head because we got to find Christ in our mess. Christ, Merry Christmas. Finding Christ in your mess. Wherever you're at, today, if we could find Christ right there in the midst of it, in the mess, in the mess, in the name of Jesus Christ. Find Christ in your mess. What is he trying to say to you? Is he trying to build you up, encourage you today? He's trying to fill you up with hope. Is he trying to put you in a situation where your total dependency would be on him? Today is the day that we would open up our hearts and we would find Christ in our mess. I ask you today, in the name of Jesus Christ, right now, Jesus, that you bring healing in our hearts in this time of need. We're all in need of a Savior. We're all in need of Christ to come in the midst of our mess and begin to heal our situation. We're in the hospital today, Father. We know that you have healing powers. Is there anyone that need healing in their hearts, healing in their minds? Anybody, if you can just lift up your hand. If you need prayer today, today is a day not to be shy. This is a day that we lift up our hands, we lift up our hearts and say, God, I am in a mess and I need you, Jesus. I need you to fill my heart with joy again. I need you to heal my mind from this distress. Father, I need you. I need you. Anybody need him? I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need you. We need a confession. I need you. I need you, Lord God. Prior, prior to me coming through these doors, I had so much going on in my mind and my heart, Lord God. And I pray right now that you would remove the pain, the burdens off my heart in the name of Jesus. You can lift up your hand if you believe that. God has the ability to do all things. Today is the day that we can believe it and we can receive it today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You know, God breathes fresh wind in the hearts of each and every person. You may be that person that was like Ruth and, and she was a Moabite. And, and being that she was a Moabite, she didn't believe in God. The one who sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sin. If you're that person, just lift up your hand. You may not believe it. You may not understand it. But I want to pray with you today because no matter what, you can be a part of the family of God. No matter where you come, you don't have to believe to belong. You don't have to behave to be loved. But right now, you can lift up your voice and accept Christ Jesus, your Lord and Savior, and be healed and never be the same again. Jesus has the power to break the shackles of every hurt, every sorrow, every pain 
in the name of Jesus. Lift up your hand. Lift up your voice. Declare, I need you, Jesus, because my situation can be messy, oh God. And so today I pray that you, you're, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Ghost will come upon us in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. That you will bring healing. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, we want to thank you. We love you and we give you glory. Let us all pray. Say, Lord Jesus. I recognize that I'm a mess. But I'm your mess. Because today, I open my heart. And I invite you in. Not only be my Savior, but I need you to be my Lord, to rule my life, to guide my life, to fill me up with hope again. Fill me up with joy again. Fill me up with great expectation for what my future holds in your hands. Wash me with your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on and stand to your feet.